The things of this world will pass away. I don't care who you are or what you have. It is going to go away. I had a friend that used to tell me all the time, he says, every because he was fairly wealthy, he had a lot of nice things, and he would tell me, everything I own is junk. It's just that some of it hadn't gotten there yet. When I was a kid growing up in the church, now, I know some of you didn't grow up in a church, and I know most of you didn't grow up with your dad being a preacher. But the church where I attended, and my dad was the preacher, we had this thing called Bible Bowl. And it was pronounced like that, Bible Bowl. And if you were a part of the church there, you had to participate in Bible Bowl. And I remember one year, Bible Bowl was on 1st and 2nd Samuel. And I remember looking at 1st and 2nd Samuel, thinking to myself, how can we know all of this stuff? I can't even pronounce these guys' names. But as we were studying and going through, because... Bible Bowl was an opportunity for us to learn the Bible in depth and really get down deep into the Word. And I remember going through the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, and I got to 2nd Samuel. And of course, some of the stories were just awesome as a young man. The fighting and the killing and the things that were going on, it was better than any R-rated movie I'd ever seen. Not that I had seen any at that time. But what I want to tell you is when I got to this particular verse that you guys was, that was read to you in just a few moments ago, my mind started racing. Especially down here at the last verse that was read to you just a moment ago, and it says, such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. And I thought to myself, that is so cool. Three mighty warriors, and they had exploits. And I remember thinking to myself, why doesn't the Bible have more about these guys? But as you know, that it's also mentioned in 2 Samuel, but it's also mentioned in 1 Chronicles. These men are mentioned, and we get a taste of what they have done. But as a young boy trying to find a hero these three men were heroes to me and i remember talking to my teacher and asking them were these guys just really specially trained or were they just that good at fighting and my teacher says i don't know but as I've grown older. I still like this passage of Scripture because these men were the special forces of that day. And I like special forces stuff. One of my favorite things that Tyler did in the Army, my younger son did in the armor, is he shot a gun that shot grenades and uh, blew things up. And he's got a video of it. I don't think the Army was supposed to let him have that video. So don't tell anybody that I said anything. But it was just, it was just so cool because you could see them go and then they'd hit and then they'd blow up and it was just cool. And I love that special forces stuff. I just thought it was really cool. And any of you who've served in the military, my hat's off to you. I, I never served. I've got two sons that both served, but I never served. But I tell you what, I love some of the things, the stories I hear from those of you who did but one of the things about these three guys that they did which I thought was so cool is their king said oh if I just had some water from the well and these men broke through the enemy lines and got some water and came back and man I wish somebody would put that on the big screen for me to watch Because I can just see these guys fighting through that line, going through that line constantly, battling, and then two of them are fighting off everybody while one of them gets the bucket and puts it down in the well and brings it up and pours the water and then brings it back to David. It must have been something to behold. And 
I think to myself, these guys are my heroes. And as a young boy, I wanted to be just like them. I thought they had to be strong. They had to know how to use the sword. I mean, as a young boy, I thought David was cool too because he took a slingshot and killed Goliath. And I had a teacher in, in, uh, school, in middle school, I think, that gave us slingshots like David had. Now, this was before everybody got sue happy and you sued people for doing things like this. But we had a pack, a pack of leather and, and a strap and you would fling that thing over your head and you'd let go and it would fly off and the rock would go anywhere but what you, where you wanted it to. And uh, there was a window that paid the price. But my point being is the Bible to me when I was growing up was so alive. But today the Bible is still alive. And I want to talk to us as men today, seems how it's Father's Day, on how to be a mighty warrior for the King of Kings. Not for David, but for the King of Kings. And the very first thing that you've got to do is you've got to learn how to fight. You have to learn how to fight. I, I know both of my kids, when they were growing up, we tussled and did different things with, with uh, each other just learning to play fight not get really mad but I remember one day when my oldest son who is bigger than me and he was bigger than me at the time and he came up to me and he says dad I think I can take you now and I said oh yeah son and he says yeah and I said come on and he came at me like this and I quickly went under his armpit right in here and hit him really hard. And his arm went numb. And he says, stop, stop, stop. I don't know what you did, but I can't feel my arm. And I said, that's one of the 101 things I know that you don't. Don't mess with me, boy. Until this day, they really think that I know stuff that they don't. But the thing of it is, is, is we all need to learn how to fight when it comes to spiritual battle. Paul was telling Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life. And I want you to underline those words, take hold of the eternal life, because that is how you learn to fight. You see, we can't fight until we embrace our salvation. There is no way for us to fight until we embrace our salvation. And a lot of us want to be forgiven of our sins, but a lot of us don't really want to embrace our salvation. Because when you embrace your salvation, you have to let go of the things of this world. The things of this world will pass away. I don't care who you are or what you have. It is going to go away. I had a friend that used to tell me all the time, he says, because he was fairly wealthy, he had a lot of nice things, and he would tell me, everything I own is junk. It's just that some of it hadn't gotten there yet. And everything that we accomplish and everything that we own and everything that we desire, it's just junk. It's just some of it hadn't gotten there yet. And we need to embrace our salvation. You see, until you embrace eternal life that has been promised to you as a man of God, you're still going to be living on this earth. And looking at the things of this earth. But if you really want to fight the battles that are going to be for, in front of you. The spiritual battles. The battles for your family. The battles for those that are downtrodden. You've got to embrace the salvation that God has given you. And until you embrace that salvation and you start living as though you are a child of God destined for heaven. You are going to be worthless as a fighter for the king of kings so the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to learn to fight well how do you do that well letter a you got to understand that being passive is not an option being passive is not an option 
And if you're a Christian here today and you are being passive and, and, and you want to know what does it mean, Neil, to be passive, I'm going to tell you what it means. It means you come in here on Sunday morning and you sit in your pew. Now just think about that word for a minute. You sit in your pew and do nothing else. That is a passive Christian. I love the fact that a few weeks ago while I was gone that John Shackelford did a lesson called All In, and I actually grabbed some of the paperwork that he handed out on that Sunday, and I put it back there on one of the tables, because if you didn't get some of the, those papers filled out or you want to look at it, we have them back there, and you can turn them in to John, because he, he is collecting those, because he's given you an opportunity for you to be all in. But the problem with the church, the problem with a lot of men when it comes to them fighting is they want to be passive. And you can't sit in your pew and just come in here on Sunday morning and think you are going to be a mighty warrior for God. Letter B, you've got to know your gear. You've got to know your gear. That's one of the things I enjoyed about Tyler being in the Army and watching the different things that he did, whether it was airborne or uh, he was an engineer, so he got to blow things up and things like that. But that's one of the things I enjoyed when I would go to visit him. He had a closet full of gear, and sometimes he would take it out and he would show me the different things that he needs to do. Well, we as Christian men, we have gear as well. Look at the scripture in Ephesians. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. And I want you to know that in order for you to stand as a mighty warrior for the king of kings, you've got to put on the armor. And if you will, just put on your notes below that. Read on. Because in that passage, it gives you the things you need, the gear you need, and what it's for. And we can explain that to you better if you need help with that. Letter C, you need to support your king. You need to support your king. And when sometimes we have people that will say things like, I love the Lord. And, and I, I, I like it when people tell me they love the Lord. But there is a difference between loving the Lord and being a servant of the Lord. You see, a lot of people want to call Jesus Savior, but they don't really want to call him Lord. Because Lord gives you the connotation that you have to do what he wants. And a lot of times we come in here on Sunday morning and we want to say, I love you, Lord, and we thank God for our salvation and we partake of the communion, but we don't really understand that we have to support what the king wants out of our life. I, I remember when my kids were little and they would come up to me and they would say, Happy Father's Day. And I would say, Thank you. Now go clean your room. Well, they didn't much care for that. But I know a lot of Christians that are out there today that say, I want salvation, and Jesus says, great, now go do this. Eh, not so much. Look at what the passage says. Jesus' own words, not every one of you who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one, and underline these words, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. God has a plan for your life. He has responsibilities for you to do. And if you're not doing them, you're not really supporting the king. Well, the second thing you've got to do is you've got to fight even when others run away. And I took this all out of this passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 11 and 12. Next to him was his, uh, Eliezer, the son of Dodai, an Anoite. One of the three mighty warriors, I love that, three mighty warriors. And he was with David at Posdanum when the Philistines gathered there for a battle 
at a place there was a field full of barley. And a, a friend of mine said the reason why they fought so hard there is that field was full of barley and that's how they make beer. The troops fled from the Philistines. The Israelites fled from the Philistines. David and Eliezer were, were there, and, but they took their stand in the middle of the field and they defended it and struck down the Philistine or struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. Look, look at that verse. And the Lord brought about a great victory, but they had to make their stand. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, it says that Eliezer's sword, his arm became so tired that his hand froze to his sword as he was fighting. And I don't know how that works. I don't know whether you just get a cramp so bad that you just can't let go of your sword. But I can imagine what it must have been like for these guys. And when everybody runs away, you stand and fight. Luke chapter 21 and verse 19, Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says this, Stand firm and you will win life. And you need to go back and read that passage because what it talks about there is it says people are going to hate you. And it talks about the things that you will go through as a warrior for God. And he says, stand form, firm and you will gain life. Number three, don't run when the odds seem to be against you. Don't run when the odds seem to be against you. I've been doing this preaching thing for a while now. And I got to tell you, a lot of times I want to give up. Because it seems like I take two steps forward and three steps back sometimes. I, I heard a story of a preacher that struggled with preaching, kind of like what I do, and, and he quit. And he went to work for the funeral home. And another preacher friend of his came up to him and says, Hey, why did you quit and go to the funeral home? He says, Well, you know, when I was preaching, Sister Mary, she was struggling with a lot of drinking. And I worked with Sister Mary, and I got her straightened out. She quit drinking. But you know what? After a couple of years, she went back to drinking. And he says, and there was Bob, and Bob was running around on his wife, and I got Bob in my office, and I set Bob down, and I straightened him out. I showed him the scriptures, what he should be doing. And you know what? He quit running around on his wife. Until about four years later, he started running around with her, with another woman. And then there was little Joey, who was always lying. And I brought Joey in and I straightened him out and told him about what God says about lying and all that. And you know what? He turned out to be the biggest liar in town. He says, so now when people come into the funeral home and I straighten them out, they stay straightened out. <laughs> Don't run when the odds seem to be against you. Abishai, the brother of Joab, was the chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men. Underline that word. He raised his spear against 300 men. I can't even imagine trying to fight 30 men with a spear, much less 300. And he says, whom he killed, and so he became as famous as the three, but he was doubly honored above the three and became their commander, even though he was not included among them. And I love this, because this verse in Nehemiah helps us to remember that it's not by our strength that we do this stuff. It says, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Underline those words. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, and for your home. 
The fourth thing you need to remember about becoming a mighty warrior is you can't wait or don't wait for perfect timing. So many times people have great intentions to do things and they they keep waiting for the perfect time for doing it. And I think there is some discernment that we should be waiting sometimes for the timing to be right. But we can't always wait for everything to be perfect. If we waited for everything to be perfect, we would do nothing. The scripture here is Benaiah, son of Jadoa, a valiant fighter from Kabil, because never mind, performed great exploits, and he struck down the Moab's two mightiest warriors. Pretty impressive. But then it goes on to say, who also, or he also went down into the pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And I just, when I was reading this, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, these other guys, they had swords and on, and he went down in a pit on a snowy day, and I I got to looking at that, and I thought, that doesn't really make sense to me. That's, it's a lion, right? But it says he went down into a snowy pit on that day. I got to tell you, last night I was up most of the night because there was a storm that came through our neighborhood. Maybe some of you heard it or not. I see one of my neighbors nodding her head. She heard it. It was amazing. Uh, we had hail about the size of marbles. And I just happened to be in a portion of our house near the fireplace, and we have a metal cap on our fireplace, and when it, that, that hail was hitting our fireplace, it sounded pretty cool. But in that storm, during that lightning and the rain, you know what my first thought was? I wonder how many people are not going to be at church tomorrow because it rained tonight. I wonder how many people are going to find another reason not to worship with the saints. You see, so many times we wait for everything to be right. We wait for perfect timing. Acts chapter 24 and verse 25 are some of the saddest words as Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. And then he underlined these words, when I find it convenient, I will send for you. There's some of you in the audience this morning that know you need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. You know that God is going to judge you at some point. You know that there's more to this life than what's here on earth. But you're waiting for convenience. You're waiting for that convenient time to be a Christian. I I remember as a kid, I got in trouble a lot. I know you can't imagine that. But I got in trouble a lot. Me and my two brothers, we talked about things. We had spiritual conversations at times, especially after we got beat really bad. And, And I remember one of our spiritual conversations went something like this. Don't you wish you knew when you were gonna die? Why? Well, because if you knew you were gonna die, you could do anything you want, and the day before you could repent. And you can make it into heaven. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. This is the mindset of a 12-year-old, okay? Not now. But the point being is a lot of us are waiting for the perfect time to become a Christian. I, I remember this kid I baptized some time ago. I studied with him. He was in his 20s. And I studied with him. He'd been coming to church his whole life, never baptized. And I sat down and I studied with him. I showed him the gospel. He already knew all this stuff. We went over it again, and I said, okay, now, are you ready? He said, no, not yet. And I said, what are you waiting on? He says, Neil, I'm waiting until I'm a better person to be baptized. I said it'll never come 
it'll never come. And some people are waiting to become a better person. They're waiting on the timing to be right. They're waiting to get rid of some sin in their life. It doesn't matter what you're waiting on. You're waiting on the judgment. And none of us know when that day is going to come. My friend Linda, who works at the funeral home, was talking to Tyler's girlfriend, Erin, and she was saying, how does Linda do that? It doesn't seem to bother her. She's working at the funeral home. And I said, oh, yes, it does. Nancy spoke up, says it really bothers Linda when she has to do a service for a child. And I said, it also bothers Linda when she's doing a service for somebody the same age as her. Because when you're doing a service or you hear about somebody the same age of you passing away, it starts to make you think of your own mortality. Number five, if you're going to be a mighty warrior, you got to look for bullies. You got to look for bullies. There are bullies in the church. There are multiple bullies outside the church. There are bullies that are out there trying to change our kids' identity. There are bullies in the world today, and we need to recognize that, and we need to fight for those kinds of people. It says, and he struck down an Egyptian who was five cubits tall, although the Egyptian had a spear like a weaver's rod in his hand. Benaiah went, up, went against him with a club. And he snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. That makes good TV right there. Can you imagine? Now, a lot of people want it. First thing Nancy wanted to know when she was looking over my notes, she said, well, how tall is that? Well, it's about seven foot five. Now, we don't know how tall Benaiah was, but let's just, let's just say he looked like Logan. And Logan goes up against this guy, and he's got a spear that looks like a weaver's rod, which is pretty thick. And Logan goes up, and he grabs that spear, hits him with the club, makes him drop the spear, flips the spear around, and runs him through. Logan, that makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? <laughs> but here's the thing. This guy was a bully. And we as mighty warriors, and you can flip over to the next page, need to take care of the bullies. Look at what it says. Jesus is condemning the Pharisees because they're doing everything right in their mind. It says, Woe to you, teachers of the laws and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglect the more important matters of the law. Look at you men of church. You come here, you go to Bible classes, you do all these good things, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, and it is justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the further. The, the, the former. My point to you here is, folks, men, we need to start standing up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. We need to start standing up for the children that don't have fathers. We need to start standing up for the single mothers. We need to start standing up for the widows. We need to start standing up for those who are downtrodden and not just say, I'm really sorry they're dealing with that. I, I heard a story once of a farmer whose barn burned down. And everybody in town came around to see the barn as it burned down. And there was about 40 people there. And one guy says, you know, I'm really sorry that that happened to you. And another person says, yes, I'm sorry too. And finally the fourth or the fifth person says, I'm sorry $50 worth. How sorry are you really? And the question for you today is, are 
you willing to get in the fight? Well, how do I know when I am a mighty warrior? I, I always struggled with that story about David. I, I'm thinking these three guys risked their life to go get him water. And, and when I was younger and I read this, I was like, this is crazy. These guys fought to get you a drink of water. And they went through enemy lines going in and coming out. And they bring you this water and they're like so excited. I'm sure exhausted, but excited because we have served the master. And the master takes it and pours it out. And I struggled with that. Until I read this verse again. So the three broke through the Philistines line. They drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem and carried it to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out to the Lord. How do I know if I'm a mighty warrior? When I have done something to cause someone to worship. When I have done something for someone to cause them to worship. You see, a lot of times I will do things for people and they will hug me or they will pat me on the back or they will talk about how great Neil Farr is. But I got to tell you, when I'm a mighty warrior is when I do something and it causes them to bow down to God. Or as in David's case, he poured the water out before the Lord as a sacrifice that he could not take such an honor that these men had done for him. The second way we can know that we're a mighty warrior is when you get your name on the list. Is when you get your name on the list. You see, there is a list. And, and if you go to 1 Chronicles and you read through that, when it gets to the end, it starts listing the men that were David's mighty men. And it goes down the list, and you read the names, and if you're like me, you don't even have a clue how to pronounce them. It's never been my gift. I flunked phonics. What can I say? But you know what? I can guarantee you, if my name was on that list, I could read it. Look at Revelations chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out their name, the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then there's the other side of that. In Revelation 20 and verse 15, Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your attention today. The things I brought to you this morning, I brought to you because of the fact that I have a passion for your soul. Monty Best was talking today about Acts chapter 2 and 3,000 coming to become members, 3,000 people being baptized. And he looked at me and said, Neil, wouldn't you like that? And I thought, I'd be so tired of baptizing people if I had to do 3,000. But I got to thinking about that. And I got to thinking, why not? Why not fill up this church building? Why not baptize 3,000? All it's going to take are some mighty warriors going out to do battle and causing others 
to worship God. I have a passion for your souls because the last thing that I want is that any memory of any of you coming in my head and you not being with me in heaven. I love my kids and they are amazing young men. I am just I am so proud of the job that Nancy did raising them. <laughs> uh, what she did basically said, whatever your dad does, ignore it and do what I tell you. But at the end of the day, no matter what they accomplish, I want them to be in heaven. And if you love someone deeply which I do you I want you to be there with me this morning we sing an invitation song like we always do and I, I gotta tell you as a preacher when it comes to the invitation song I know a lot of it's just kind of like okay it's almost over if he'll hurry up but the truth of the matter is this is the most important part of the sermon because you have to take what I've presented. You have to take God's word and you have to decide, am I going to listen to God's word and be a doer of the word or am I going to be a hearer only? And if you're here and you're not a member of the Lord's church, you have to decide, am I going to be a Christian and be buried with Christ in baptism? Or am I going to keep walking the way I walk? And as we sing this invitation song, my prayer is that each one of us, including me, will look at our hearts and ask God to show us what we need to do. The invitation is yours as we stand and sing.